Hi, this is Jonathan Gardner, back from a long break. Um, I apologize. I meant to do this video earlier. I just haven't gotten around to it. Been on vacation for the past couple weeks and been sick and various things like that. Section 833, reflection and transmission at a conducting surface. So what happens when you have a wave uh, coming in towards a, a material that conducts um, you know, electricity? So um, the setup looks like this. We have our conducting surface on the other side and has a sigma resistive, uh, resistive to your conductivity. Um, it has its own epsilon and mu, of course. And on the left side, we have a non-conducting material with just epsilon mu, uh, V1, V2 over here. So as, you, as we've just talked about, the, the wave over here is going to have a kappa that's complex, um, while the wave on the left side, nothing surprising is going to happen there. So let me write out the wave equations. Uh, I'll go rather fast here. If I go too fast, you can review. Uh, if you want to understand some of the algebra behind some of the stuff, this is a really good exercise for you to dig in and look at the details. I'm not going to cover them all here. <clears throat> okay, our incident wave is a vector. It's complex. It's a monochromatic plane wave, So, and it's coming along the x-axis towards the uh, surface there. So um, it's complex. It only varies according to x and time. And it looks like this. It has a complex constant magnitude times e to the i kappa 1 x minus omega t. And that points in the j hat direction. So it's polarized vertically. And the magnetic field, um, b i, that's incident, also varies only according to x. And it looks pretty much like this, except for it's divided by the velocity e to the i kappa 1 x minus omega t in the k hat direction. The wave is coming in this way. All right, the reflected wave, this is not surprising to anyone who's, it not, should not be surprising to us because we've done this like about six times now. Um, so it has e naught r, e to the i minus kappa i x because it's traveling backwards. That points in the j hat direction and the magnetic field I apologize for my handwriting, uh, is 1 over V1 E not R complex constant I to the, I'm sorry, we have a minus sign here because it's pointing in the opposite direction, uh, minus Ki kappa I X minus omega T in the K hat direction, or rather in the negative K hat direction, so it's inverted there. The transmitted wave looks like this. It has its own uh, complex constant there, and I did not want to put that there. Um, ignore that. E to the i kappa 2 complex x minus omega t pointing in the j hat direction. And this complex factor, as we discussed earlier, has the effect of atti uh, introducing an attenuation. So as the wave, as you go deeper into the surface, the wave gets weaker and weaker. And then we have our magnetic transmitted wave that's going to be 1 over V2. Oh, I'm sorry, they have, um, they do it this way. Kappa 2 complex divided by omega, E not transmitted, complex, E to the I kappa 2 complex X minus omega T pointing in the K hat direction. So this is when X is greater than 0, and this is when X is less than 0. Okay. Uh, we applied some boundary conditions. You can look this up from an earlier lesson back in section um, uh, chapter 7. I didn't write down the section number. I apologize. Uh, if I get the time, I'll put a link to it, but you should know these by now. So we have to use a more general form. Um, so the first boundary condition says that the D fields uh, in the perpendicular direction have to be equal. So E1 uh, in the perpendicular direction has to equal E2 epsilon 2 in the perpendicular direction. Well, we don't have any perpendicular electric fields in this case. Well, actually, we have a we have to add in a surface charge there, which uh, we're just going to ignore. Um, uh, won't affect how the wave behaves anyway. So we have no electric fields in the perpendicular direction. This is satisfied trivially. The second uh, boundary condition says that the B fields in the perpendicular direction have to be equal. And since we don't have any perpendicular B fields, this is also trivial to satisfy. The third condition says that the parallel E fields have to be equal. 
E1 parallel has to equal E2 parallel. And the fourth condition says that the parallel B fields, um, the parallel H fields, vary according to the surface current. So we write that out like this, mu1, B1 parallel vector has to equal one over mu2, B2 parallel vector, plus the surface current cross n hat, where n hat is pointing this way. And uh, it's, it's somewhat e easy to show that that surface current has to be zero as well. If it weren't, then we'd have, since it's a conducting material, we'd have an infinite field there. So, um, and remember for, for the conducting materials, we have the J vector is equal to sigma times the E vector. We have a current flowing in the direction of the electric field, whatever that is. All right, so um, next we apply these boundary conditions three and four. Three will give us, using the same uh, stuff that we've done before, that uh, E naught I, so this constant complex number has to be equal to, well, added to E naught R has to equal E naught T, okay? Rather trivial. Uh, the next one gives us that E naught I minus E naught R has to equal beta times E naught T, where beta is the familiar, uh, uh, where did it go? Yeah, beta is defined as um, mu one, V one times this kappa two complex all over mu two times the omega. So beta is complex, okay? And um, if you're not comfortable with complex numbers, then you're probably looking at this and like and getting freaked out, but it really is not as hard as you think it is. Uh, applying these equations together, we derive that the reflected complex um, magnitude has to be equal to one minus beta over one plus beta, just like we did before, uh, times the in incident wave, and the transmitted field has to be equal to two over one plus beta, hardly surprising, times the incident field. Okay, nothing new here. Um, except for we have a complex number for our beta and we have a complex number for our k2 or kappa 2 so um, this is pretty much all you can determine um, until you start making assumptions about the material uh, one assumption you can make is that the material is perfectly conductive so as sigma approaches infinity then your beta will also approach infinity um, the reason for that is because uh, the kappa uh, depends on sigma, and as sigma explodes, kappa explodes as well. So, and that will give you, uh, that leads you to the conclusion that the reflected wave has to be equal to the incident wave, and the transmitted wave is zero, okay, which is a perfect mirror, right? So, when you find that uh, superconductor, you can use it to be a perfect mirror. I don't think we've talked about yet um, the, the frequency dependency of epsilon mu and so on and so forth. But uh, if there were no frequency dependency, if, if things just behaved the same way at high frequencies, then we could build perfect mirrors for any kind of you know uh, frequency. But uh, since we can't do that, oh well. Uh, the second case is the more realistic. Uh, sigma is much greater than omega times epsilon 2. So we have a very, very good conductor here. And what that implies is that beta, the magnitude of beta, is going to explode. It's going to be very large. Okay. Um, he uses a bit of algebraic manipulation here um, that might be unfamiliar to you if you haven't, if you're not familiar with how physicists approach these things. The bottom line is I'm not going to walk you through it. Um, you have to understand about Taylor series. You have to know how to take um, a binomial, something minus something squared, where the second thing is small, and just take the first term, which is the dominant term in this case, and so you end up with the result that 1 minus beta over 1 plus beta is turns out to be about equal to 2 beta minus 1. Okay. Um, when you plug that into the reflection coefficient r, which is just you know e naught r, complex divided by e naught i, both of these guys squared, then you end up with, um, this is approximately equal to 
um, one minus two beta, just flip, flip it around because it's not gonna matter, which ends up being about equal to this monster, one minus two times beta plus beta star, con the complex conjugate there, divided by beta squared. Okay, uh, if you go back in the book earlier, you will uh, recall that our kappas um, has, a, has a real and an imaginary part. The complex conjugate, the beta is equal to, where did I pull it down here, is equal to, basically has a real and imaginary part, both of them the same magnitude at this range because at in this condition, you get the interesting result that the real is about equal to the imaginary part of that um, kappa. And that's about equal to this simplified form, omega sigma mu t, of course, divided by two. Two, two, um, sure, whatever. And so the r actually reduces down to this simple thing, one minus the square root of eight times, he has mu two over mu one, and then he has omega epsilon one divided by sigma, okay? And this is, I, I know I'm covering a lot of material here. If you have questions, you need to go back and review earlier material. I'm sorry, there's no other way to do this. And um, with that, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments. And I hope everything is understandable. Thanks for your time. Goodbye.